Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 1619 Project discussion. Uh, it is December 1st, first day of December, first Friday of December. And today we have special guests. We have Sharon and Dick, Sharon Kyle and Dick Price from the LA Progressive. It's an award winning newsletter here in LA. And you can find out more about them by looking on our blog post. They were also previous presenters here, did a very interesting uh, presentation back in June of this year which you can find on our website, and it is also up on our YouTube channel, so it has been recorded. This meeting is being recorded, uh, so anyone in the Witness Protection Program might want to change their name on the screen. And uh, if, you're, if you're okay with that, well, we'll go ahead, and without further introduction, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Sharon and Dick, who will take it away and, and give us the presentation today about wokeism and CRT and all of the fictional and accurate information about it all at the same time. So Sharon, I think uh, you're taking the lead. So Sharon, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. Well, um, I don't know that I'm going to say I'm taking the lead. My husband and I pretty much work together on everything. Isn't that right, honey? That's right. Thanks Thanks so much, Dick, for inviting us again. We, we enjoyed it last time, and I'm sure we will again this time, too. It's always a pleasure okay. having you guys talk, so go ahead. So we're Dick and Sharon, and for those of you who don't know us, we're a married couple. We've been married for a uh, little over 20 years, and um, neither one of us, uh, this wasn't the first marriage for either one of us. Um, before, before I was married to Dick, I was married to a, a Black man, and Dick was married to a white woman. And when we came together, um, we had just so much in common, surprisingly. We're both the oldest of four kids. Um, we both had been married before. Politically, we're on the same page in every possible way. I don't think that there's any difference between the positions that Dick and I take on anything. And we publish a daily political magazine, which Dick has already mentioned. It's a digital magazine. It's called the LA Progressive. And we've published it for more than 16 years. We have over 40,000 articles on the LA Progressive. But when we first met, um, I just told you that we had a lot in common. One thing I noticed is that whenever we had a disagreement, it tended to revolve around the lens from which we see race through. So I began to do a real deep dive into understanding why it was that Dick and I, who agree on just about everything, but on racial matters, there was a disconnect. So I began to do a lot of reading and that has not stopped. Um, and so that what we're gonna present to you today is somewhat of an, uh, um, a result of a lot of my research. And while I go to screen, I'm gonna do a screen share. Dick, do you wanna say anything, add anything? Yeah, so, so in addition to that, I mean, for the last 16 years, as she said, we published the LA Progressive but the subtitle of the magazine is, is The Centrality of Race. So uh, a, a lot of conversations revolve around whatever is going on in the world around racial justice. And as you know, for the last 15, 20 years, uh, Trayvon Martin and George Floyd and many other things, so that's been topic number one uh, uh, many a day. Great. Okay, honey, I have, does everybody see the screen? It says, uh, from woke to critical race theory, Dick and Sharon chat. Yes. All right, great, great. Okay, so as I've said, um, we published the LA Progressive. This is just a snapshot of the LA Progressive. And uh, I, I took the screenshot of this, our glossary of terms. If you go to laprogressive.com, you'll see that there is a glossary and we have hundreds of terms there. We don't have woke in our glossary. And there's a reason that we don't have woke in our glossary. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So I start off with this cartoon uh, where the dark haired woman is saying, our schools are woke, CRT is woke, libraries are woke, libs are woke, books are woke. And then the blonde haired uh, woman says, um, I see, uh, define woke. And the dark haired woman says, uh, woke is um, uh, woke, uh, woke stuff I don't like. And it turns out that that is kind of, and I'm going to stop sharing for a second, that is kind of where we stand with wokeism. 
And so what I want to show you is just a brief, I'm going to go back to, uh, you have to forgive me because I'm going to be going back and forth. I'm going to show you a brief two minute discussion about wokeism by one of my favorite people. Her name is um, Brianna Joy Gray, and she was the communications director for um, Bernie Sanders. So let's see, are you seeing that? I'm gonna go to, you know what, Dick, it might be good if you put your screen on there so that I can see what they're seeing. I wanna make sure. Can't hear her. Okay, I'll stop. Make sure you press the button that says share shout sound when you do this. Yeah, share I'm looking for that button. It's in Hold the lower left. Moment. It's in the lower left corner of the window that comes up. There are two toggle buttons down there. One is share sound right. and one is smooth video. Right. And you can check both seeing... check both of them. Yes, I'm not seeing those. I'm not seeing those buttons because I know what buttons you're talking about. And why am I not seeing them? Yeah, they should be when you hit share screen, they should be on the very bottom in the lower left corner there. Share screen. And this is such a good video, but I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I can, it's a two, it, I just wanted to share two minutes with you. And because it's taking so much time, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go back to the, the slideshow. Yeah, I don't know why that's not showing up on your screen. When you hit share, when you hit share screen, it should be there in the lower left. Yeah, it usually it's when is. You, when you hit share screen before you actually share the video, that's right. the time it shows up. Yes, right. Yeah, I'm not seeing it, and I'm not going to uh, spend any more time trying to do that. All right. Well, we got something here. You're sharing now the PowerPoint, I guess, right? Yes, I'm going back okay. to the PowerPoint now. Okay. Yeah, when you start it, it'll go to full screen. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna skip over Brianna Joy Gray, and I'll just tell you what happened. So Brianna Joy Gray was the communications director for um, for Bernie Sanders, and now she is a host on a show called Rising that comes on. It was it's um, a show that's sponsored by The Hill, which is a, um, a publication, and she is the uh, left leaning host and then they have a right leaning host and they interview people and she was interviewing a woman a young woman who had written a book and one of the chapters of her book was dedicated to wokeism she is the republican young woman and what brianna joy gray was asking her was to please define woke and this woman who actually wrote a book and dedicated an entire chapter to wokeism could not define woke um it finally ended up that this woman says that woke has something to do with the desire of liberals to dismantle society. And Brianna Joy Gray was just kind of shocked. Um, it, and the little exchange went viral. And then Brianna Joy Gray apologized to the audience and said, look, I wasn't trying to capture a gotcha moment. I was really trying to understand how this woman defines woke because and then beyond, Brianna went on to say, because when I was being raised, what woke meant was to be aware. And so I want to talk about my own personal experience with the word woke and wokeism and what it has meant in my life and why I think it's so important. To begin with, wokeism has been weaponized over the past couple of years by people like DeSantis. And there's been an effort for hundreds of years to exclude uh, Black history 
anything having to do with what has happened with Black people in the United States forever. Um, most of you are of an age that you know when you went to school, I don't know if you went to public school or private school, you really didn't learn very much. In your history books, in, as a matter of fact, American history wasn't considered Black history. Black history was something separate. And probably, um, just looking at the amount of gray hair I see on the screen, you probably didn't get a lot of information about what was happening to Black people in your uh, public school lessons. And there is a reason for that. So when Dick and I got together, that was one of the first observations that I made, was that Dick's experience of Blackness was very different than my experience of Blackness. And what he learned about Black history was different than what I had learned. Now, even though I didn't get a lot in school, but where my lessons came from was life, what my grandparents told me. Now, I am the fourth generation removed from slavery in my family. So when I was born, my great grandmother was alive and she changed my diapers and so on. And I had, I don't have any memories of her because she died uh, when I was a, a baby, but mother was a slave. So I'm just four generations away from slavery. And there's a lot of information that comes down through the generations just by interacting with your uh, family members. But if I could go ahead, sweetheart. The, so, so you might wonder, I mean, why, why is it big hoopla uh, around critical race theory, weapon to put people in their place? And, and in our discussions, I mean, the reason is that people, if white people, if the dominant society really understood the history of the country around racism that that didn't end at, at the end of the Civil War, I mean, it, uh, the, the repression of black people is continues to this day. If we really absor uh, absorbed that and understood that, it would almost be incumbent upon us to do something about it. And the people that are making fun of critical race theory and wokeism, they don't want to do anything about it. They don't want to give up their advantage that they have by virtue of the color of their skin. Right. Dick, your sound is really fading in and out a lot. And it's a lot worse than Sharon's sound somehow. Okay. So, Dick, you, you might need to get closer and talk later. I'm just using the, the computer. All right. Okay, so so what I did, uh, one of the things I did, along with doing lots and lots of reading, is I looked at our lineage. So I, and and Dick Myers, you may be too, with Ancestry.com, because Dick, Dick Myers and my husband and I, we know each other through an organization called Coming to the Table. Coming to the Table takes the um, people who are descendants of slaves and people who are descendants of enslavers and try to come together so that we can heal. So in doing my research, um, what you're looking at right now, you see it says Martha Gordon. I pulled out a person in my family tree, Martha Gordon, who was born enslaved in 1851 in Louisiana County, Virginia. And then I pulled out a person from Dick's uh, family tree at who was born around the same time as my uh, sec my uh, second great grandmother this is dick's second great uh, grandfather edwin j price who um immigrated to the united states from england but he was born around eight, uh, he was born in september 1847 and my uh, um ancestor was born in 1851 i'm not sure of the date to begin with let's let's look at some a major difference here I'm not sure of the month that Martha Gordon was born because oftentimes, and not oftentimes, most of the time, slaves were not given a birth date. They didn't know. Um, they they sort of estimated their ages. They didn't have they didn't have birth dates for the most part. So um, so Martha Gordon was born into slavery, and then what we're taught. Well, what we were taught, and certainly my generation and the generations before me in American public schools, is that slavery in 1865. So she was born around 1851, 1865, everything is good. Uh, she can go on about her way, and 
start life just like the immigrants. So we have um, Edwin J. Price, an immigrant that came from England. Um, Martha, whose family was here in hundreds, built the country. You think, okay, 1865, let's, let's see what happened to Martha. Well, in my case, this is my second great at Martha Gordon, almost immediately after 1865, she was rounded up with about 800,000 other formerly enslaved people, and she was placed in a mental institution. Um, and a uh, part of her um, recovery process, because she was so mentally deranged, part of her recovery process was that she had to work for free. So this was one of the ways that we, we say that um, there was neo slavery after 1860. Slavery actually continued, and it continued in a variety of ways. So, Dick's uh, uh, second great grandfather, Ed, Edwin J. Price, you want to say anything about Edwin? Well, so, so, what I know of my, my dad's side of the family is they came in at this time in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and they came uh, to uh, northern Iowa and southern Minnesota and very quickly became farmers and, and shop owners, uh, very quickly moved into the, the middle class. My, my mom's family is, is more diverse. One, one thread came, uh, an Irish thread, immigrated to Montreal and then Western Canada and then became cowboys and farmers in the Dakotas. But, but, but I think the, the point is that my family came willingly desiring a better life and very quickly found it found that better life and actually came here to land that was, stolen, that was level, trees cut down and prepared for them. And this picture that you see of Dick's family, um, I can tell you that of all the people that I know in Dick's family, I have experienced nothing but being welcomed, being loved, being a full member of the family. So this is not a group of racists. This is a group of people who came to this country to work hard, and they did work hard, but they also benefited from their whiteness. So, so let, let me add. So, she says they weren't racist. I, we we know that some were abolitionists, but by and large, where they lived was all white parts of the country: small town in in southern Minnesota, small town in northern Minnesota, where. Uh, person uh, was there, not because of racism necessarily, but it was all white, which I think, um, I mean, my observation through the course of my life, if you get a group of people that are all white or all one color, they, they are much less trustful of other kinds of people and more susceptible to racism. I think that's also why the, the desantuses of this world uh, have fought uh, uh, desegregating our schools because you know, black and white and brown and, and red kids grew up and, and went to school together. They would know each other as friends and colleagues and, and potential dates or whatever. But if they if they go to an all one race school, they'll be fearful of other races. So what does this have to do with wokeism? What does this have to Woke. What does this have to do with critical race theory? So what I'm sharing with you is how it is that Dick and I had such vastly different views of racism. Now, I've already shown you where my family is coming from, how I am the generation not enslaved, but already my second great grandmother was institutionalized almost immediately after um, the Emancipation Proclamation and stayed institutionalized for 20 years. These are not stories that are told. It is through wokeism, being aware, doing a deep dive, doing research, that you begin to learn that there are some aspects of American history that has been mythologized. It's one of the things that people call this American exceptionalism. And I showed you a cartoon with DeSantis saying, let's whitewash all of these little dirty parts of what happened to America. And it's a lot, a lot of dirty parts, just, just not taught. 
And this is what wokeism is. So we see this wonderful picture, this image here of, uh, you see the Statue of Liberty standing in the background. And uh, the assumption is, and I think this is an accurate assumption that we have um, immigrants coming mostly from Europe coming in and they can't, they're excited, they can't wait to arrive um, in this new country. One of the stories that we're never told about the Statue of Liberty is that the Statue of Liberty wears chains and so I don't know how many of you know this story about the Statue of Liberty. I certainly didn't know the story uh, when I first met Dick. I'd heard of it, but I hadn't done any research on it. Well, it turns out that, um, I don't know if you can see the image here. The image in this shot is of the feet of the Statue of Liberty. And you will see that there are shadows around her ankles. And one of the links of the chain has been broken. Well, when the Statue of Liberty was gifted to the United States, one of the main reasons that that Statue of Liberty was given to the United States was in honor of the abolition of slavery. Two people were responsible for getting that statue designed and built and raising the funds to get it here to the United States and then building the pedestal. And one guy's name is um, Eduardo Leballier and the other person's name is escaping me right now, but I will give you guys links if you wanna know the story. So the Statue of Liberty, the, the whole concept came from this French guy who was a staunch abolitionist. He spent his life Slavery. And he was so thrilled. He had gone to a party in 1865. He was thrilled to find out that the United States Civil War had been fought and that the Union had won. And he met, was a sculptor, and he was talking about this brainchild of why don't we see if we can create a, a statue? He's, he's wealthy. And they did. They created this statue, but he wasn't wealthy enough to also build the pedestal. And, and if any of you have ever been to the Statue of Liberty, you'll know, and I don't know if you can see it here, it is standing on a very large, a tall uh, set, a pedestal. If you can look at where the street might be, this bottom part is not part of the statue. So he had to go around the country to raise money to uh, build the pedestal. And who did he have to go to? He had to go to the deep-pocketed benefactors in the United States who, for the most part, were formerly people who enslaved people. They benefited from slavery, whether they built the ships or they imported, um, exported the cotton or they were somehow involved with uh, the triangle between the Caribbean, the United States, in Europe where they exported rum, none of these people wanted to fund the building of the pedestal if these chains were on the statue. Because the original depiction was that the chains were on the wrist of Lady Liberty and they were broken and the chains were on the ankles. Well, they quickly realized they were not gonna be able to unless they dropped the chains from her hands, and they did. And as a, as a result, the Statue of Liberty was accepted as a gift, and the story behind the Statue of Liberty was forever hidden until actually right after the Obama administration. So I was doing research. There's a book about it. I wrote this article in the LA Progressive, got a lot of flack from people, and then finally, the National Park Service began to tell the, the truth about the Statue of Liberty. They knew about the chains. The problem with the chains at her feet is it is almost impossible to see those chains unless you are in a helicopter hovering above the Statue of Liberty. But if you're on the ground here, as you can see where the feet are, there's no way that you're able to see the chains. <laughs> This is what wokeism is, learning truth. So 
another truth. And I'm just going to give you just some tidbits of truth that I've learned. These were rumors that I loved as a child, but then I went back and did more research and found out that a lot of the rumors that I knew of as a child actually were rooted in truths, like why the Civil War actually ended 16 months after um, Robert E. Lee surrendered. So we look at Robert E. Lee, the general that was on the Confederate side, surrendered, and still the Civil War went on and on and on. And this is the History Channel. The History Channel has a, a great documentary about that. Um, NPR also has the untold history of the post-Civil War neo slavery I want to talk about now is that slavery did not actually end in 1865. After the Civil War and after the Emancipation Proclamation, there were various types of slavery and attempts to re-enslave the people um, of African descent who had been held in bondage. So, two books that have been Oh my gosh, I, I can't tell you how much I've learned from these books. Um, one is Slavery by Another Name by Douglas A. Blackman, and the other one is Worse Than Slavery by David Oshinsky. In these books, what they talk about is how the penal system has been used after slavery to re-enslave Black people. Now, after slavery, well, I'll put it this way. Before slavery, there were essentially no Black people in prisons. Now, does that mean that they didn't break the law? Of course not. Uh, what it means is they were not considered people. They were considered property. And it was up to their enslaver to correct them if they had broken the law. But then after uh, 1865, 20 or so years or so, very many. Then they created after the um, after the first ten years post slavery, all of these new laws were created, and they were called the Black Codes. And the Black Codes were laws that only applied to Black people. Um, a lot of these were called were vagrancy laws, and they were associated with being unemployed. So it became um, unlawful to be unemployed. So if you were unemployed, considered a vagrant, and then you would be arrested and put into prison. And once there, then you would be work for free. And this business of uh, what we call Jim Crow justice, where special laws only apply to black people, this didn't just happen willy nilly. There were over 800 thousand black people who were re-enslaved either in um, under prison conditions or mental institutions. So that's almost 25% of the former slaves were immediately re-enslaved. I just think it's a little lighthearted. We ban books, not guns. And the donkey says, what about books about guns? <laughs> 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 Just thought I should throw a little lightness in here. I have to admit to you guys, you know, when I do this research, and honey, you could you could uh, chime in here. It's, it's overwhelming because so much of what I research about are things that I heard about. But then when I dig down and find the source of this truth and find that it not only is it true, but oftentimes it's much worse than I thought. It's it's very depressing, very depressing. Yeah, yeah, I actually, I sometimes worry about her. I mean, I, I said that a lot of our conversations revolve around race, partly because we published the LA Progressive, uh, uh, which has a, a centrality of race as its, its tagline. And, and partly because we've been running this uh, sociological experiment here for the last 20 years with this interracial marriage on top of, and that's not so unusual, but on top of uh, publishing a, 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 a journal that focuses on racism. And, and I'll come down here some mornings and I'll see the, the weight of the world has, has fallen on Sharon's 
shoulders because there's news of yet another black man being shot or a black woman being imprisoned. Um, it it becomes and and where this leads, I mean, it's not uh, it's not only affecting Sharon. I mean, there is a thing called weathering, weathering of, of black people, where just the fact of living in this world with this continuing undercurrent of repression of black people, now heightened by people like Trump and DeSantis who are, are, are making gains out of stirring up hatred, um, it, it wears on black people. It, it is why black people don't live as long as white people. So over, um, over the years, uh, the American Library Association has been keeping track <clears throat> of the number of uh, attempts to ban or restrict library materials in the United States. And in uh, 2022, you can see the uh, attempts have skyrocketed. Um, no doubt there's been a relationship between the attempt to ban books, DeSantis, Trumpism, um, anti-woke and critical race theory. And the problem with this anti-wokeness and the opposition to critical race theory is that people have absolutely no understanding that all it is is an attempt to share truth. What many of the people who oppose critical race theory and, appro and oppose what they call wokeism, what they're wanting to go back to is a time when we strip the history books of the full history of the United States. I, I think that's a part of it. But but another part, you know, going back to George Wallace and Lester Maddox and all through the ages, uh, racism sells. Racism, you, you trumpet racism, you're, you're likely to get elected in certain parts of the country, uh, maybe even get elected president. And, and I, I think it's a, a cynical ploy knowing that most people don't really know what critical race theory means and and don't and as, as the video she tried to show you can't really define wokeism but they know it's like a flag it's it's things they don't want it, it's a rally around and and let's pull together and let's hate the black people and and benefit uh from that hatred yeah yeah so the goal of the manipulators appears to be to maintain the myth of Americans' exceptionalism, and also to avoid any accountability of the many harms that American policies have caused to BIPOC people, and that's um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, but especially Black and Indigenous people. But what does critical theory mean? So the, the term, there's a general term, critical theory, which was developed by scholars at the Frankfurt School, and it's a social theory that aims to critique society as a whole. Critical theories attempt to find the underlying assumptions in social life that prevent people from participating in a true democracy. So these underlying assumptions in the view of critical theorists create a false consciousness. And that's what we've had in the United States for the vast majority of our history. We've, um, I can remember as a child growing up and watching cowboys and Indians on television and these stories that they would tell that the Indians were always these bad guys and the cowboys coming to the rescue of the damsel in distress. And these are myths and it developed a false, con uh, false consciousness and a false narrative. And so what critical theory tries to do is strip away the myth and let's start learning from the beginning before these myths were introduced. Critical race theory, the, only, the general critical theory, emerged as an outgrowth for critical legal studies at Harvard Law School. So critical race theory is taught at law schools. Dick and I both have been to several critical race theory symposiums at UCLA Law School. They do a four-day symposium once a week. I mean, once a year, I'm sorry. They do a four-day symposium once a year. Dick and I have been, I don't know, maybe three or four times. And they are amazing. You have law professors from all over the country come in and teach various aspects of law 
stripped down without the imposition of the racism that exists within our law. And that's what critical race theory does. It tries to understand uh, the truth of this country. It, one of the shorthands I like to use is podcasts. Um, Vox uh, has a podcast called The Weeds, and they had a great one called What is Critical Race Theory Anyway? The person that was interviewed for this podcast is a professor named Ian Hanny Lopez. He also comes to UCLA's Critical Race Theory. I highly recommend, this is a, a shorthanded way to learn about critical race theory, and that would be to go to the podcast. But for the most part, critical race theory in the United States is taught at law schools. It has nothing to do with lower secondary education. And um, in the book, Haney Lopez says, because we live in a country in which important institutions, capitalism, racism, and even democracy are interwoven, we need to begin to think of racism in much more sophisticated ways, not simply interpersonal. So it's not simply mean people doing racist things, even though it includes that, but it's also about our economy, our government, and our politics. And that's the core insight of critical race theory. It's really understanding race without race without racists. Yeah. In the simple way I think, it, it is a, a, an understanding that racism is embedded in all the institutions of our country at often times without our full awareness. And one of the reasons our full awareness is not there is because of U.S. history and how we for so long try to uh, erase the race part, like the Tulsa massacre. You know, many people didn't understand or know about Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, that horrendous. And there were literally dozens, perhaps scores of other massacres around the same time, not just in Tulsa, but across the United States. Uh, just a note on the Tulsa race massacre. So Tulsa, Oklahoma, had a thriving Black business community, a, a full-fledged Black com uh, community with wealth being generated, and uh, with and, and the white people of the region burnt it to the ground and killed a number of people. They destroyed it. Why? Because they did not want Black people succeeding in their midst. And it's why the 1619 is so important. Um, and, and so important that you guys are doing what you do. But you know that in response to the 1619 project, the Trump administration started their own 2021 project that countered all of the assertions that Hannah Nicole Jones made in her 1619 article uh, that the New York Times uh, ran and later the book. And now there's a documentary, a series. So uh, this, I like this cartoon, he says, but I have to learn critical race theory simply to know what I'm not supposed to teach. Well, this is absolutely not true. As I've said, critical race theory is a, a, a way of critiquing American laws taught at the law school level, it has nothing to do with high school or even college, for that matter. But some of the things that we should understand is that the basic building blocks of democracy, one of them was the Voting Rights Act. That has been stripped away. And that has to do with critical race theory, understanding how our laws support racism. I have some suggested readings here. Um, I know this is tiny, but I'm gonna hand this presentation over to Dick Myers and um, so, some of the authors that have really helped me to gain a deeper understanding are Brian Stevenson. I'm sure many of you may know of Brian, who he is an esteemed civil rights attorney. A movie was made about him. He has represented young people on death row. You know, in the United States, we actually have people that are sentenced to death that are not even 18 years old. Um, so there's a, a bunch of books here that are very helpful. But uh, in addition to books, one of the podcasts, aside from the podcast that I just showed you from The Weeds, is a series called 
seen on radio. This is one of the most enlightening series that I've ever heard of. And you can find it, just do a search for Seen, S-C-E-N-E, on radio podcast. And I think they have five seasons. Season number four, it's blow, it, it just blew me away. I've listened to it twice. Um, and I encourage anyone who really wants to have a real understanding of American history to listen to this podcast. So part of our American exceptionalism is that we deify our founding fathers. Here we have on the left, a picture of George Washington crossing the Delaware. And there's a famous painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, and a little known fact about that painting, and you can't see that in this cartoon, is that there is he has a slave on the boat with him who's uh, doing a lot of the rowing. But anyway, this cartoon says, uh, steady on lads, tis a perilous trek over 300 yards of water for not but our, our freedom. But I assure you, this will be in all the history books, our freedom. I, and then who is this our that he's talking about? And then clearly on the right, seriously, you think they'll want any of this in their history books? So as a black person, it really irks me that we don't tell the truth about our heroes. How many of you know that George Washington had false teeth? I'm sure most of us know we're taught that in school. But did you know that many of the teeth in his mouth were teeth that were pulled out of his slaves? mouths. His teeth were made of bone, hippopotamus ivory, and human teeth from his slaves. And I, you know, I, I think about the people that we deify. They're on our currency, and they did such horrendous things. When I think about that, then I compare that to what happened with the Nazis. Do they have statues of Hitler? Is he on their currency? This young lady, J.C. Dugard, just to give you a sense of what this feels like to me, J.C. Dugard was a beautiful, beautiful little 11-year-old girl on her way to school um, back in, I think it was like 2009 or so. And she was kidnapped. I don't know if any of you remember this story. This is a story that has just stuck with me. She was kidnapped by a man, a grown man, grabbed her, put her in his van. This is right here in California, Northern California. And he kept her in a shed that he had in his backyard. He kept her there for 18 years. And JC bore two children for this man. He raped this little girl over and over and over again. And she had two children by him. Maybe you guys will remember him. She was found, she was freed, and thank God, the girls are alive. But I want you to think about this guy, Philippa Garita, just the way that I think. I look at him and I'm disgusted that he was able to do this to this child. Can you imagine if we erected a statue to him? If we said, oh yeah, yeah he did this to JC, but he had some other positive qualities about his life. He did some other really good things. And yeah, we want to name it. Let's name some schools after it. You see, I believe that this country will have made a serious step forward when we look at the heinous acts that were done toward Black and Indigenous people in the same way that we look at what was done to this precious little girl. But we don't look at it that way. I think that when we get to that place, we know that we are headed toward healing. And then finally, uh, one of my favorite YouTubes uh, is by this uh, gentleman who has a YouTube channel called Knowing Better. And he talks about the part of history you've always skipped. And he talks about neo-slavery and how slavery existed well, well into the 20th century, into uh, like around World War II. That's when... United States got serious about truly getting rid of slavery. So I'm going to stop sharing now.
if anyone would like to um, ask questions or make comments, please, please feel free. If you raise, if you just raise your hand, then uh, uh, Sharon, if you just call on people because I can't really see to to monitor. And, um, uh, I'd like to about... make I'd like to make a request, um, Sharon. You made uh, various uh, references to whether it's uh, articles or books or podcasts. If that could be put in the chat, so that we would be able to follow through on those things. Will do. So I will do that while we're um, right here online. Wouldn't it be simpler to send them the presentation? The slides, can you do that? Valerie, it would be easier if I could just send everybody the presentation slide material along with links. That would be fine. That would okay. be beautiful. Yes. What we can do is we can put the presentation up on a Google Drive and have it available. And then I can mention it in the blog post and put a link so that anyone who looks at the blog would be able to download it. So I think that would be the easiest way to, to make that accessible to everyone. Great. Will. Yeah, very good presentation. Lots of new history. I'm concerned that it also downgrades the God doctrine or the idea of American exceptionalism. And it, it, it's easy to do because certainly the part of history that's been suppressed was suppressed. There's a continuing racist part. But I'm concerned that the values and ideals and practices that are touted that should happen are American values and ideals and practices, however poorly they're, they're done. There have been changes, as you know, and their changes toward the history, the full history of our own nation, I think is in a project that we Americans, and put it broadly, should honor and follow and recognize that we're not all these horrible practices that we have in our DNA and our history, the means to overcome them. I, I would like to comment on that because I have my own uh, 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 approach to that. And my approach is that we have two countries that we're talking about. One is the aspirational country that is yes. a model for the entire world and has been an inspiration to people and has re rewarded people from all over the world who have come here to experience. And then we live in a real country which has never lived up to what the aspirational country is. But the aspirational country is real. It has had an impact on the world and it continues to have that impact. And the United States is a unique country in, in the sense that it was developed and founded on a set of ideas which were imperfectly stated and, and certainly not lived up to but have become real and have an impact on the world. And so that's the distinction that I make. And I honor yeah. that country, the, the aspirational country. That's the one I think of when I honor the American flag or do anything patriotic. Yeah. And the real world is just what we're living in and trying to make better. So yeah, that's I, my that, own that, personal that's adjustment. That, that's, I go along with that. That sounds right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good point. And um, I, I thought the presentation was excellent. It was really succinct and, and enlightening and good materials. Um, a couple of things uh, I, I thought about, well, I've been thinking about lately with the critical race theory being in the news and so forth and, and the books being banned and teachers not being able to teach. And they've actually spelled it out. I think it was in South Carolina, but it may be somewhere else that uh, nothing could be taught basically that would make anyone feel bad about who they are, who their ancestors were, what their ancestors did. It's obviously directed at, at white people, white children being made to feel uncomfortable about that. But wouldn't you think, uh, what about the black children? When they're reminded that they were slaves and all the things that they had to go through, even though those things aren't spelled out so much, but just the thought of it, nobody worries about the black children feeling bad. So that's, yeah. that's one huge uh, 
discrepancy. And the idea of the aspirational story having to coexist with the actual reality story is, you know, they, they, they can both be true. They're both there. You know, one doesn't cancel out the other. I think it has to be recognized by by teachers and and everybody that bangs. And then in your in your uh, slide about the books being banned, it was sort of consistent uh, except for the very end. But there was one year it was twenty twenty that it dipped down to about half of the. It was about like four hundred some you know per year of, of that. But so, do you have any idea why that would have been? Why no, I don't. I don't. That thing, those numbers came from the American Library Association. So perhaps you can, um, you know, Google that and, and find out because they keep track of that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, this has been, I'm just going to jump in. This has been uh, going on a long time. And I, uh, around 50 years ago, when I was teaching in, a, in an independent school that was mostly white, uh, a book came out about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings and a parent went ballistic and he said he didn't want his daughter's image of Thomas Jefferson ruined. And um, the school backed up the teacher and supported the teacher uh, with the idea that it seems kind of not quite right now, but with the idea that real normal people who make mistakes in their lives can do great things. And so if you're teaching your children that um, only flawless individuals can um, be honored is wrong. Now that's kind of different now, it's 50 years later, but it did kind of it did kind of set in that um, seeing all sides of a person was okay, and even though Thomas Jefferson had not only had a slave but had a relationship with slaves, um, with a slave, uh, doesn't take away from what he accomplished for the country. And now the approach now would be maybe different, but. Um, I thought it was, I was not involved in that. I was teaching, you know, four-year-olds at that time. So I wasn't part of it, but um, I was actually proud of the way the school backed up the faculty member and said, mm -hmm. this is this is Thomas Jefferson. And kids need to know about Thomas Jefferson. And um, it was it was pretty good. The school always had an issue around Martin Luther King Day and um, part of the problem was the few black children did feel um, center of attention that they didn't want to feel uh, when when they're and and as we look back on it now, I think it's because it was a it was a one day event, Martin Luther King Day, right? And then the rest of the school went on as it, as it went on, and none of the books that we had 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 any real information about black history in any meaningful way whatsoever. And um, that's why I'm so, bo I'm bothered by teachers being told they can't teach. Mm. Yes, yes. I, I was a school librarian and um, um, our dear late Mike Babcock was my boss and a parent, I said, what do I do when a parent comes in and says, I want you to get these books out of here? He said, you just put the books right on, keep the books right on the shelf and send them to me. And um, uh, to my knowledge, it never happened, but. Um, Not the mic, the sentence. Yeah. So if, uh, if, <laughs> if, if, if I, if, if I, if, if There's I made a respond. suggestion that you go see Mike probably took the wind out of their sails. Probably. But now um, the if, if, don't, don't have that option. I mean, in some places, yeah. Right, right. So, you know, that's why I ended this presentation showing you Philippe um, Garita, the awful man who kidnapped that child and kept her in bondage for 18 years and uh, raped her and had her father uh, two children. Thomas Jefferson was opposed to slavery until he married 
um, Sally Hemings uh, sister who the sister came with hundreds of slaves. And then suddenly he went from being a person who opposed to slave was opposed to slavery to an, a person who enslaved 500 people. He also had a secret tunnel and they've only discovered this in the past 10 years at Monticello, a secret tunnel that connected his bedroom to Sally Hemings bedroom. They've only just, the, uh, they've, they've restored it in the past 10 years because there was always um, this, this disbelief that he actually fathered Sally Hemings' six children. And there were those who were saying, well, it wasn't Jefferson. Even after DNA came out and showed that the Jefferson lineage and the lineage of Sally Hemings, they had DNA a DNA connection. They were saying, oh, well, that was one of Jeff Jefferson's cousins. But now they've actually found the tunnel and found the room, the whole section of the house, where Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings uh, were together. So this business of, you know, can't a man who's done horrible things also do great things? I suppose that's true. I understand that Hitler was a wonderful painter. Uh, I think that uh, he, he painted these beautiful um, still lifes. I'm sure, sure he did. But I'm certain that uh, most Jews don't really give a shit about his paintings. I think the interesting detail there that you didn't really emphasize is that Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson's wife had the same father. They were half sisters. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I said that's why I said that was 50 years ago and things yeah. are different now. But there was an attempt to open up the history of Thomas Jefferson in a way that was sort of unheard of in my circles of life. And uh, still try, we're still trying to do something like that. Um, and I believe uh, the slave that he took with him on his trip to France was actually his son. Because I, he was I, the son of, I think it was the son of ha Sally Hemings that traveled with him to France when he went on his trip to France and he was accompanied by a slave. And I think that's who the slave was. If I read that correctly, when I was looking at the history of this. So I think, I think Donna has a question. Yeah, I had a couple. So the, the, the Sally Hemings story put me in mind of something I only recently learned, which was, I think it was 1835. They forbade the, uh, importation of slaves anymore you could keep the ones you had uh, but you couldn't bring any more into the country and so what that meant was uh, obviously you had to breed your own and so there was whole farms devoted to uh, sl slave farms breeding farms you know which and so it was the the jc dugard thing played out you know on steroids on quantity i mean you, you weigh the balance of that. Just just think about all those women being violated over all those years. And nobody, I mean, I only just learned about this a couple months ago. Uh, so it's it's pretty. And then there for a while, there was a lot of conversation about uh, taking down the Confederate monuments. And I read an article that mentioned there was a, a in New York City somewhere, there was a small, like a little uh, what you, the thing, a little monument not a monument just a stick basically with writing on it and it it uh the inscription was this is the block where slaves were chained to be auctioned off i mean it wasn't a big deal sort of thing but the thought was was it better to leave it up or down i mean it's better to leave it up because yeah to to remind people of what happened but leaving it up is going to make black people feel bad whenever they drive by it so i just wondered what your thought was on that that's something i i I couldn't really decide upon how, how I, I even felt about it. And then one one last thing, um, how much do you think the idea, the people that want to hang on to power and minimize the damage that was done to, to Black people, how much of that is fear of having to make reparations? I would, I would like to break in and answer some of those questions, uh, especially about... <laughs> Uh, my take on history, the idea of, of 
of looking at, at George Washington and the teeth that he had and, and Thomas Jefferson with his uh, uh, affairs with Sally Hemings isn't to tear down those two individuals. They were leaders of their society at times. And what they are emblematic of is the culture at that time uh, approved of slavery and approved of treating black people as, as property and as animals and so forth. And, and the thing is, and, until we recognize that, that that's a true part of American history, uh, we can never heal from it. So after World War II, Germany took an assessment of what they'd done to, to the world, what they'd done to Jews and gypsies, and, 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 and tried to make some kind of reparations. South Africa had, had a period of, of reconciliation. I mean, they, they owned up to the fact that the white uh, population had abused the black people for decades and decades and centuries, and they made some attempts to do something about it. America can never have that kind of reconciliation and unless we get honest about what we did to Native Americans, what we did to Black populations, what we did to brown people. If we paper it over and, and get offended and, 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 and laugh at wokeism and laugh at critical race theory, we'll never heal. We, we will never heal the racial divide in this country which puts black people in particular, but people of color in general at a great disadvantage and destroys the nation, the notion that we're some kind of uh, shining city on the hill. And if, and if I may, I, I just cut off my other computer. I came over here with Dick. So um, what for me would be ideal is if the, we would understand that this um, awful uh, history of the United States doesn't represent all of the history of the United States. This is a stain. It's but it's a, and it's not a stain on white people. It's a stain on the on American history, and it's something that we all should aspire to change. So, um, Donna, when you were talking about uh, Central Park, you know how would Black people feel? How do all people feel? How do all people feel about their country having this stain on it unaddressed and actually still continuing? There are vestiges of that right now. Right now, somewhere in the United States, there's somebody who has been imprisoned and shouldn't be in prison. Somebody in solitary confinement. Somebody that's experiencing racial discrimination in employment, in housing, in, in, in hospitals. This goes on every single day. And until we accept that this is what this country was founded on, we're not gonna be able to change. And it certainly isn't just about black people or black people even fixing it. This is our country, it's your country, it's my country, it's his country. We should all want it to be a true participatory democracy. So, so I mentioned earlier that my family, several parts of my family came from the British Isles at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, came to the upper Midwest, uh, became farmers and, and cowboys and so forth. And the fact that if we acknowledge that in, in our history, racism had been an ugly blot on our soul does not take away from the contributions they made in creating these towns that they created and gathering the wealth and having generations of children that contributed to the country. It, it, in fact, it would make it, it would, it would put their contributions in even better light if, if we knew that they had not participated in these wrongs with other, with uh, people of color. We have lots of hands here. Yeah, uh, Will, Ali, how are you going to reach nearly half the country that would like to darken the stain and turn <laughs> history back. Yes, Sally, that's the part that makes me sad. Um, and you have I to figure out how to reach them. And I personally am at a loss. I don't know. I know. People, my son says, mom, people believe they don't think. And that's the problem. We have a whole bunch, a whole generation, maybe two of people who spent their lives looking at their phones or their computers and never were taught to think 
that if I do A and B, C and D will follow. And that's what we're seeing the result of. And uh, not apparently not everyone, we kind of assumed, and when the Constitution was written, it was assumed that man was basically honorable. You can no longer assume that. But, but I, let me say, you know, racisms don't pop out of the womb that way. I mean, they're, they're not, there's no three-year-old racist. What they are is they're trained into a racist way of thinking. Uh, and how do you combat that? You integrate the schools so that they come to know people of other races as friends. You're honest about the history so that they and, and that that's why it's important to fight this battle against critical race theory and against wokeism, because those that movement wants to keep people stupid so that they can stay racist so that certain people can keep getting elected. And we will never ever have a true democracy as long as there is racial and ethnic division. Will. Yeah. But we're, teetering, um, we're teetering on the edge. Yeah, democracy my, is teetering on the edge. Yes. And if from what I see with the huge, the huge wave of support for a felon is terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. And we are so close to losing democracy. I, we all have to wake up. But what can we do other than vote? And then many people are gerrymandered out of having their vote really count. You're so right, Sally. You're right. Let's not forget that we are actually doing something right now. And and we the answer is education and the kind of social change that Dick mentioned just now. I'd like to say a, a couple of other things about the statues too. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson are honored with statues, but George Washington and Thomas Jefferson are being honored for the contributions that they made to the country. There are statues of Robert E. Lee and other Confederate heroes all over the country. And when you talk about the statues honoring those people, they're not being honored for the for the contributions that they made to this country. They're being honored for the con for the contributions they made in revolt of the country. And so what you monu what you create monuments to is the things that you want to endorse. And Jefferson and Washington were certainly flawed people, but they also did wonderful things for the country. And uh, the daughters of the Confederacy have sponsored all these other statues. So I think when you talk about monuments, you're talking about uh, a couple of different things here. And the tearing down of these monuments across the South is a really uh, important step forward, I think. And one other thing, the idea that uh, learning the truth makes white children feel bad uh, personally, I don't feel responsible for what my ancestors might have done. I've looked at my my ancestry doesn't have any indication of any enslavers in it. My grandparents on my mother's side came directly from Ireland. And unless some of them were involved in the slave trade somehow, I don't I don't have any indication that any of my ancestors were involved in 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 as enslavers. But the responsibility is for learning the truth and not doing something better yourself. That's where you become responsible. And I certainly have benefited from some of the wrongs that people did. They weren't my ancestors, but I'm white and I certainly have benefited from the kinds of basically crimes that were committed. So my responsibility extends to doing something about that because I have benefited from it. And so uh, I'm not responsible for what was done, but I'm responsible for what I do now. Well, you know, they're different. Uh, well, I I was a member of the Mayflower Society for decades and and was proud of it. And my father was governor general of the state of Connecticut. And then I found out a more about the real history of what the pilgrims did to the to the indigenous people. And I, I canceled my membership. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Will has his hand up. Well, yeah, yeah I've, I've been sitting here with my hand up, but I'm, I'm patient. I'm, my, my grandfather actually was born in Vertville, North Carolina during slavery times. 
and his family had house slaves that took care of him and places. So I might directly connect with slavery. But the thing I wanted to ask about was not so much that, but the how do you treat people who have mixed uh, backgrounds and not racially mixed, but uh, ideologically mixed. And I'm conscious that in Jefferson's time or in slavery times, actually in Lincoln's times, as I remember, there were people who were anti-slavery racists. They believed that black people were essentially different from white people, and there's black and white, not Latino or Asian and so on, essentially different and somewhat inferior, but you should not enslave people. My father was a lawyer in North Carolina who was a segregationist, and his law firm bitterly opposed the Klan in North Carolina, the Ku Klux Klan, but he did believe in separate schools and argued as a school board member against integrating the schools in my hometown. So there's these levels of bigotry. Along those lines, what I'm, I want to ask about is what are your views of what they call cancel culture? Okay, so uh, let's see, let's take this. We've got cancel culture, um, the positions that various white people took who, there's, there's really a continuum of, of racism, but it all, in my opinion, falls under the umbrella of uh, white supremacy. And so when you think about Lincoln, who was not, he certainly did not support slavery, but he would be willing to allow slavery to exist if that meant that the union would stay united. Or he'd say, well, if mm -hmm. it can't stay united with slavery, then we've got to get rid of slavery because his number one goal was to keep the union together. Yeah. And if it meant throwing black people under the bus, well, that's perfectly fine. Now, as a black person, that's not fine with me. <laughs> so but under the back of the bus, not the whole bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but but there was this deep-seated belief in the supremacy of white people, the supremacy mm -hmm. yeah. of white culture, the supremacy of everything having to do with whiteness. And that is one of the um one of the foundations that is um, deconstructed in critical race theory. I mean, there were ancient cities, ancient times where you know some of the oldest the oldest university known to man was in Timbuktu, Mali, in Africa. But we don't know that history. Our belief in the supremacy of whiteness has no ground. It stands on nothing. Um, so, how do I feel about that? I just feel that it is um, a position that is taken without sufficient research and investigation. And how do I feel about cancel culture? I am a proponent of having strong, robust um, research, discussions. I don't believe in just shutting down someone because their opinion differs from mine. I do not support that whole concept of, of cancel culture. Thank you. I grew up um, in LA and uh, from parents who were from Iowa and Nebraska. And um, I always thought of them, I went to integrated schools, uh, junior high and high school, and I, they never said anything overtly racist, but there was always an implication when I was in elementary school and didn't we didn't really know any African American people except the woman that cleaned our house. Um, that as a race they were somewhat less than white people. Um, um, but I mean and this is just kind of a I guess I was really naive, but and it's almost embarrassing to tell the story on myself, but when I was in the seventh grade in junior high school, um, we had some group meeting at somebody's house and it, it was integrated. The junior high was integrated and we went to a black person's house and I walked in and was kind of nervous about it. And I, uh, you know, we went in the kitchen to get snacks and opened the cupboards and by gosh, there were Cheerios in there and cornflakes and everything they had in their house was the same as we had in our house. And it was such an eye-opening thing for me, something so simple, it, um, so simple. And I don't know 
if anybody else has had that experience, but for a, a 12 year old, it was um, kind of shocking. And I was so glad for my going to school experience. And um, my parents moved away before my brothers got to junior high. And just within the last couple of years, I said, I was how happy I, I was that I'd gone to Dorsey High School. And he, he went to school in Orange County and he said, I'm very happy for my white high school experience. Thank you very much. And so I'm, I'm sorry for him. Um, but I'm, it doesn't, I don't know, it's just kind of embarrassing, but. I have something that I, I would like to share. It won't take long uh, that uh, this business, someone mentioned uh, the belief that white uh, culture is superior to virtually everything else. And this is from John Lamedeer, who is a Sioux Lakota. Before our white brothers arrived to make us civilized men, we didn't have any kind of prison. Because of this, we had no delinquents. Without a prison, there can be no delinquents. We had no locks nor keys, and therefore among us there were no thieves. When someone was so poor that he couldn't afford a horse, a tent, or a blanket, he would, in that case, receive it all as a gift. We were too un uncivilized to give great importance to private property. We didn't know any kind of money, and consequently the value of a human being was not determined by his wealth. We had no written laws laid down, no lawyers, no politicians. Therefore, we were not able to cheat and swindle one another. We were really in bad shape before the white man arrived, but I don't know how to explain how we were able to manage without these fundamental things that so they tell us are so necessary in a civilized society. Wow, that's beautiful, Sally. Ouch. <laughs> I, 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 I lived in the in the Southwest for thirty years, and I I I still have friends on the Navajo Reservation, and you know I think about this, and I think if the white man had listened to the indigenous people who were already here and knew how to live in cooperation with the land. We wouldn't have global warming, warming, warming to the extent we do. So many things would be better, but greed. That, uh, Donna. Um, that was beautiful, but I'm thinking it's a little bit rose colored in the sense that, I mean, didn't the Indians fight viciously amongst themselves? The very well, that's what said, that he died in 1976. So this was last, uh, you know, Century. Yeah. So he's talking about now, or he's talking about the cowboy and Indian days. I say cowboy he's, and Indians. He's talking about crazy. how things were when the white man came, and yeah, how white it, people destroyed what was a very functioning culture. But it also did include warring on each other tribally, right, and fighting for uh, hunting yes, rights or whatever. Yes. That's it's true. The awesome. Indians did compete for land and hunting territory, and they did kill each other and fight for land. So it's it is like a little. Everything else. It is a little rose colored. Yeah. The whole picture has to be yeah, included. Exactly. You know, not that 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 isn't beautiful. And along those lines, um, it's also often said that the Indians were the best horsemen, and they had this affinity for horsemen, horsemanship. Uh, they also drove horses over cliffs in order to kill them and eat them or whatever that is, is part of the history of it so uh it goes up up and down where that is because i had a question for um dick and sharon because i saw on the on your book list uh the uh warmth of other sons and isabel wilkerson books which i i really i mean they that was a life-changing books mm -hmm. for me both of them but one thing I didn't quite grasp was she and other people that write about race say there's no such thing as race. Well, right, that's there, true. so how it's a social construct. So, OK, so um, someone yeah. said race is a social construct. Race was created. The term race, the idea of race, and it was created back in about 1670, it is said, where the term white became part of the lexicon. Before that period, there were no white people. People had a geographic place that they originated from that came to the United States. So this whole concept of race was something that was happening in the colonies. And 
the reason the, the story goes that in around 1680 in the Virginia colony, there was an uprising. There were indentured servants. There were also slaves because we know from 1619. So this is around 1680. Indentured servants, slaves worked together to clear the land to, um, to enrich the colony of Virginia. But they were really getting irritated that the wealthy, who was the king, was benefiting from all their hard work. And so a guy whose last name was Bacon, B-A-C-O-N, he uh, was the leader of a rebellion. And his desire was to overthrow the governor of Virginia, the Virginia colony. And he got together blacks and whites who at that point lived together, worked together, played together. They lived, they, they intermarried because there was no race. They didn't see themselves as races. They saw themselves as people who originated from, from, from England or from Scotland or from um, Holland or from, or from um, Mali or from Senegal. They didn't see themselves as races. Well, this rebellion was successful. It took a year and they ousted the governor and they were running their own thing. What was happening in England though, was they were strategizing. The wealthy, the, the um, royalty and their army strategized, how can we take the colony back? And they know, they knew that divide and conquer is the best way to do it. So they sent their troops <laughs> back to Virginia. They were able to control them. And what they did was the people who originated from Europe, the indentured servants, they weren't penalized in the same way that the blacks were. They said, if you came from Africa, this is your penalty. And they began to treat them differently based on their race. And within 20 years, the legal structure began to change where there were different laws that applied to different people. And the whole concept of race, this construct of race took on a life of its own. And eventually the people, the white people and the black people inculcated it into their culture and into their belief system. But this is wonderful um, attorney, her name is Jacqueline Battalari. She's written a book about this. She did a lot of research on it. And she says that it took about a hundred years for it, the whole concept of race to stick. Because initially people were thinking, what, what are you talking about race? It's, it's almost as if someone were to come here in the United States and say, well, everybody that is five foot five or below, they belong to this group. And everybody five foot six and above, they belong to this group. People would say, what the hell are you talking about? But after about a hundred years of changing laws and, and doing some institutional things that validates that thought process, people began to believe it. Right. I want to right. add a couple, something there too, that the concept goes back a little earlier in the 15th century in the 1400s, uh, late 1400s, there were a couple of papal bulls issued mm -hmm. that basically made the case for the moral superiority of the European nations and gave them the moral basis for their practice of going out and conquering and colonizing other lands where people already lived, but established the, the concept of the European nation's righteousness in going out and doing that because they had a superior religion. Yes. And so to some extent that's good. And, and of course, as soon as, as soon as they were conquering these other nations, these other nations, the, the people's skins were different colors. And so the concept of racism really kind of go to some extent, at least goes back to that because it established the moral superiority of one group of people over another. That's right. And that moral superiority was based on religion back then. And if you yes. go back and start to study it, you'll see how it morphed. Yes. It morphed from religion. Like my people right. that were in the Caribbean islands, they came from Africa, were in the Caribbean islands, and then they became Moravian, right. uh, which was a religion that made them free from slavery because they became Christianized. Right. But Anne has a, her hand up. Well, now we've got the same thing happening in this country. People are trying to make it a Christian nation. 
I mean, history does repeat itself. And uh, I, I would like to very, uh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> I've got my iPad on for the sound and it's, okay. it's creating a double thing. Uh, can you hear that? Is that driving you crazy? Yes. No, no, we can okay, hang on. Good. All right, there's a solution. I'm going to throw my iPad in the oven real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> well, hopefully the oven's not with on. That all, with that all. Okay, problems, let's try this easily. again. So easily. I would like to bring up something that we have not touched upon yet, and that's sex. Um, I grew up in an extremely fabulous environment in New York City. Uh, you name it, it was in my neighborhood. Uh, one of my best friends lived across the street. He was a Panamanian Hispanic Jew. I mean, it was everything. My father was um, vice president of a union. Uh, his members got together and bought him a lifetime membership in the NAACP. We had all kinds of people in our house. Everything was fabulous until in 1971, I told them I was marrying a black man and they disowned me. Oops. I'm convinced it was sex. Their lily white angel was going to sleep with a black man. It's the only thing. We had black friends. We no. were in birth, involved in. I, I, I think that, that I'm going to jump I said in I was going to get married. I think part of that is. And there is a fear, I think, of the, you know, the black man and the white woman that comes from slavery and all of that. And I think it's still here. So it, I do it, think it goes sex farther is back than that. It's the way women were objectified and treated as property themselves. I mean, even in this constitution, they weren't considered as people. And now their abortion rights are taken away because they're not considered to have the same rights as the fetus. So it's not only that you were going to marry a black man, but you are you you know sullied somehow. Um, because you're uh, yeah, property. one of the things that you don't have your yeah. own agenda, your own agency. Yeah, because one of the things they said to me was I had the perfect right to ruin my life if I wanted to, but I did not have the right to ruin my children's life. And they were going to be have a horrible, awful, terrible life. Um, they didn't disown me completely once a year on their birthday. There was a letter or something. Um, and I don't know how to say this without sounding like I'm bragging. <laughs> So I'm just going to say it. I am the mother of two wonderful black men. And I took a great deal of pride. Maybe this doesn't uh, say anything too good about me. But I really loved it when I got to um, send them the college admission letters and say, uh, here, you want to brag? You can brag. Show your uh, show your." Uh, uh, people in your Florida retirement home that um, your grandson turned down Harvard because he wanted to go to Stanford instead. And your other grandson got his doctorate from UCLA. So there you go. I ruined their lives. <laughs> um, didn't make any difference, but um, I enjoyed sticking it to them a little bit. <laughs> well, this has been a wonderful discussion. We're running out of time. Dick or Sharon, would you like to have, add any comment to wrap up here? Well, Will, uh, Will has Will has his hand up. Okay, Will, uh, oh, go ahead. Will, you want to finish us up here? No, I'll, 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 this is real quick. One sentence. I looked up Bacon's Rebellion in Wikipedia, and it says the reason he was rebelling was the governor, Berkeley uh, of Virginia, was refusing Bacon's demand to kick all the Native Americans out of Virginia. That's part so of the story. So watch out what history says. That's that's, that's part, pretty pretty. History's that's weird, of, but go ahead and wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Dick and Sharon. This was a wonderful presentation. It led to a wonderful discussion. I'd like to invite you all back to our December fifteenth session, which is an open session at this point. And it, uh, there's a I I'd see there's a lot more that we can talk about. And if you'd like to join us on December 15th, and we could restart where we ended up here uh, if we if we show up again. So thanks very much, everyone, for coming. This recording will be placed up on our YouTube channel.
channel as soon as we can get it there. It usually takes us about half a week or something to get it up. But at that point, you can go to our blog post. It's 1619 Project Discussion on the Pasadena Village website. And uh, there will be a link to it there. And you can go back and review it and enjoy it all over again. So thanks very much, everyone, for coming. And we hope to see you next time. And thanks very much to you, Dick and Sharon. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you for having us. Great group. Thank you.